50, I'll give you uh, 48. How's that all right? Fair enough. Brother Don Champion from uh, Maine, we appreciate his ministry, and may the Lord bless you as you speak on this very important Thank subject. You. Thank you, Lord sir. bless you. Are the copies of the papers at this time? No, no. no not at this time. Both of these are just at the top. And, uh, okay. We'll do. Okay, we'll try to remember that. All right, this is just a, a, a simplified uh, introduction or review of this book, the, um, the New Testament in the original Greek, according to the Byzantine majority text form, 1991, uh, Maurice A. Robinson, William J. Pierpont. I, um, after I wrote this, I said, my, that's off to be dry. And, uh, right. and so we uh, devised some overheads and uh, I think all my overhead should be of, uh, of a well or an oasis and uh, to, to, to help simplify the, uh, the dryness of it, but uh, we'll go with it as it is. So a, a review then of the Robinson and Pierpont uh, Greek New Testament. And let's begin with a historical overview, beginning with the 16th century, and that's where the overheads come in, the... Uh, uh, visual display. The 16th century saw the end of the thousand year long dark ages and the drawing of a new era known as humanism. Not to be confused with humanism of the 20th century. This new age was characterized by a turning from ecclesiastical denomination to the arts and scholarship uh, of the arts and scholarship to an emphasis on the works of man in opposition to the emphasis on the works of the church. With this new emphasis came an interest in the literature of the ancient Greeks, and with this an accompanying interest in Greek sacred literature, particularly copies of the first century Greek New Testament. Early in the century, the Dutch scholar and theologian Erasmus studied many of the sacred manuscripts that were coming to the light of day after the millennium, of suppression and in 1516 he published a Greek New Testament in Basel, Switzerland this was followed with subsequent editions in 1519, 1522, 1527 and 1535 later in the century Robert Stephens published two editions of the Greek New Testament in Paris 1550, 1551 these editions followed closely the 1527 and 35 editions of Erasmus. Theodore Beza also published several editions of the Greek New Testament from 1565 to 1598, all based on the Stephens text. 17th century in 1603 with the death of Queen Elizabeth I, James VI of Scotland, became James I, King of England. The following year, he authorized the translation of a new Bible in English. The work on this translation began in earnest in 1607 and was completed in 1611. This version of the Bible was initially known as the authorized version and later came to be known as the King James Version, especially in the U.S. The Greek text used for this New Testament portion of this translation was the 1598 edition of Beza and also looking at the Stephens text of 1550 and 51. In 1633, the brothers Bonaventure and Abraham Elzevir published an edition of the Greek text in Leiden, Netherlands. This was very similar to the text of Erasmus, Beza, and Stephens, as well as the text used in the authorized version. In the preface of the Elzevir text, New Testament, the text was referred to as the Textum Receptum. This text became known from this as the Textus Receptus TR, or Received Text. In time, this term was applied retroactively to the Stephens text of 1550, and this has come to be associated with the Greek text that underlies the New Testament of the Authorized Version. Concurrently, or excuse me, currently, the Trinitarian Bible Society of London, England is publishing a Greek New Testament in the tradition of the Textus Receptus. And I quote from the first and last paragraphs of the preface 
of that text, quote, the Textus Receptus printed in this volume is the Greek text followed by the translators of the English authorized version of the Bible first published in the year 1611. The editions of Stephens, Biza, and the Elzevas all present substantially the same text, and the variations are not of great significance and rarely affect the sense. The present edition of the Texas Receptus underlying the English authorized version of the 1611 follows the text of Biza's 1598 edition as the primary authority and corresponds with the New Testament in the original Greek according to the text followed in the authorized version edited by F.H.A. Scrivener. End of quote. Now, the 18th century During this century, further discoveries of the Greek New Testament manuscripts added to the growing field of textual criticism. By far, the majority of these manuscripts agreed with the Textus Receptus. And because of that agreement, they became known as the majority text. In the 19th century, three major events dominated as far as textual criticism is concerned. There was a discovery of and or publication of two early unctuals, Aleph and B, in the middle of the century. Then there was the publication of a new Greek New Testament, radically different from the received text, in 1881 by Westcott and Hort. But the event that most concerns the topic of this paper is the contribution to the science of textual criticism made by Johann Griesbach. As the manuscript evidence became more numerous, it became more difficult to handle. Griesbach, among others, discovered that the manuscripts were, more or less, falling into three categories. And he used this feature to catalog the then extant New Testament manuscripts. He called these groups families, naming them Alexandrian, Western, and Byzantine. Manuscripts that apparently originated in Alexandria, Egypt, all bore similar characteristics that were unique to that group. So they were placed into the family of that name. Others differed widely from the Alexandrian group, yet agreed among themselves. And these he classified as Byzantine, the same as Virgon's traditional. Any manuscript not fitting into one of these two families by, uh, that Grasbach designed or designated, he called them Western. These manuscripts agreeing with the Texas Receptus were all located within the Byzantine family. They were by far the largest family of manuscripts. Now the Texas Receptus had become associated with this name, Byzantine Both in name and in type, also with the majority text. And soon these three names were used interchangeably when referring to the same text, that is, the Greek New Testament of the King James Version. So we have Texas Receptus, majority text, Byzantine text, all being used synonymously. 20th century. While many events have taken place in this century pertinent to Greek New Testament studies, only two relatively recent events are germane to the scope of this review. The first was the appearance of the Greek New Testament according to the majority text edited by Hodges and Farstead in 1982. The second event was the publication in 1991 of the New, New Testament in the original Greek according to the Byzantine majority text form edited by Maurice A. Robinson and William G. Pierpont. The publication and proliferation of these two volumes has created several problems within the Greek New Testament community. The first is the problem of ambiguity. For five centuries, the Greek New Testament, that is the textual base of the KJV New Testament, has been known as the Texas Receptus. For at least three centuries, this same text has been also recognized as the majority text. And for two centuries, it has been known as the Byzantine text. In other words, these three terms, received text, majority text, Byzantine text, have been used interchangeably when referring to the same 
text, the historic Biza text of 1598 and the Stephens text of 1550 and 51. However, with the advent of the Fawcett Hodges so-called majority text and the Pierpont Robinson so-called Byzantine text, these terms are no longer synonymous, since each of the latter two differ from the received text, as we shall see below. So, means just some examples. And other verses have significant portions missing, for example, Acts 9, 5 and 6, 1 John 2, 23, 1 John 5, 7. This indicates, this is a quote, this indicates that at such a point the Byzantine majority tech, uh, manuscripts are divided and it is questionable whether the words in brackets should or should not be considered part of the autograph text, end quote. A footnote on page 50 informs us that for all of the New Testament except John 7:53 through 8:11 and the Revelation, brackets indicate only inclu include slash omit readings where the main text possesses less than 80% support in the quote. For the correct reading of the Pericope Adultera, an appendix at the conclusion of the text offers an even dozen options. Take your pick. In other words, to see the proper rendition of John 7, 53 through 811, they have 12 options to choose from in their definitive Greek New Testament. For the book of, of the Revelation, brackets are used only for include slash omit cases where the main text, not including the bracketed words, has less than 55% combined support and where the bracketed words make up the bulk of the difference. So again, I reiterate while they mention Burgon's seven critical canons for determining uh, the legitimacy of a verse and they claim that that's the best way to go in practice they just seem to go with number alone it's a little ambiguous and uh, self uh, contradicting in, the, in their own printed introduction conclusion the editors of this work give strong words of praise for John Burgon, especially Burgon's sevenfold critical canon. However, it is doubtful that they would be comfortable with the agenda of that organization that bears the distinctive dean's name. They refer to those who hold a TR slash KJV only position as, quote, extreme and absurd. Further departure from the DBS is seen in the following statement, quote, The present editors would welcome heartily a good modern translation based upon the Byzantine text form, a project which will come in its own due time, in the quote. On page 48, the editors write that the goal of textual criticism is to establish as nearly as possible the precise form of the original text. This alone has been their goal. In the opinion of this writer, they achieved something else. They added yet another volume to that ever-growing pile of AID Bibles, always in doubt version. Thank you. All right, if you stay right up here, uh, Dr. Champion. We have... Uh, Bob, just four minutes, and uh, maybe some questions and input uh, that we can have from our audience. Who will be the first? Yes, right there. What is the point? I think maybe I mentioned maybe obvious to some, but what is the point of having another book like this? Is there any way of determining what point they're trying to make, or as you showed it, are they just. Uh, this is a been a project of one of them for years and years and years and so from that I'm just assuming that it was something personal to him and uh, somewhere along the way he wanted the satisfaction of seeing it published uh, obviously, they aren't satisfied like we are, I trust, with the definitive text. Here, for example, is Acts 8.37.
notice it goes from 37 to 38. Uh, that helps you a little bit uh, without uh, any mention. So they have the verse number there, uh, but no verse. Yes, sir. Bob. No, no. The book is here. Anyone cares to look at it, or the uh, introduction I found. Well, uh, that's where we gained all our information. Was uh, was confusing in itself as well. So uh, I, I bought this on sale for six dollars. That's the only reason why I have the thing. Uh, I wouldn't want to pay much more than that for it. Okay, Gary. Say that again. It was the only one they had. <laughs> to us. In First Timothy three sixteen is to us. Any others? All right. We'll take. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Champion. I did an excellent job of introducing us to this text. The AID. Always in doubt. That's a very good uh, acronym. <laughs>